Hello again, everyone, and welcome, welcome again to the latest iteration of our seminar series. Uh, recall that we're going through the Ricci flow. Uh, this week, Carl is going to continue talking about the Kahler Ricci flow and the proof of the Wu Yao theorem. Take it away, Carl. Thank you. Um, so, so last week we we spoke about just the general setup, the general background of the objects we're going to be talking about. And we ended with, with a statement of the Wu Yao theorem, which we're, we're going to recall in a moment. What I want to emphasize today is kind of some of the tricks you have in the Kähler setting. So really emphasizing the presence of the Kähler condition in this, in this argument and illustrating how it fails in the general Hermitian category. But also illustrating some kind of techniques that allow you to just bypass, for instance, higher order estimates altogether. So once you have a C2, you can just apply this algebraic theory and you get, you get everything for free, more or less. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, we'll actually find that, which is nice for me, that the main component of the proof happens to be just a second order estimate. And that's what I've been spending the last three years studying. So um, yeah, that's, that's convenient. Okay, so let's just remind ourselves that a complex manifold, which is, well, I should say more or less a Hermitian manifold is specified by the following data. So you have a Riemannian metric G with a complex structure J and a one, one form omega. And it's Kähler if this one, one form is closed in the sense that it lies in the kernel of the exterior derivative. The key examples we saw were the Euclidean metric on CN, the Fubini Studi metric on PN, and then since restricting to complex submanifolds preserve the Kähler condition, complex submanifolds of these, for instance, Stein manifolds in the case of Euclidean space and projective manifolds in the case of PN, both yield examples of Kähler manifolds. So the key propaganda from the last talk was the fact that Kähler geometry is particularly successful because since the data can be expressed in terms of a closed one, one form, it represents a cohomology class and cohomology is readily available. So this is, a, this is one of the key uh, tools and is arguably the cause of a large number of theorems. This is the great success of the field. Now, just to remind ourselves that this also makes the Ricci curvature comparatively easier to study since the Ricci curvature of a Kähler metric represents a closed one, one form as well. And it represents two pi times the first Chern class of the anti-canonical bundle. So if we wanna say something about the Ricci curvature, we could equivalently say something about the first churn class of the anti-canonical bundle. And this is really the kind of Kayla Einstein story, the fact that really these, and the Calabi conjecture and so on, the fact that these are more or less equivalent in, in certain cases, a positive case we, we don't need to worry about. So in particular, if we have a Kayla metric of negative Ricci curvature and a compact Kayla manifold, then the canonical bundle will be ample. Just to remind everyone, the canonical bundle is the top exterior power of the cotangent bundle. And just remind the definition of ampleness. We say that a line bundle is ample if the sections of some sufficiently high tensor power furnish some holomorphic embedding into projective space. The fact that these, the notion, so the yeah, no, I don't want to go into the details of why there are all these equivalences. Okay, so the converse is true by this Auburn Yao solution of the Calabi conjecture, namely that if you have a compact Kähler manifold, then Kx is ample if and only if there's a Kähler metric of negative Ricci curvature. And moreover, this metric can indeed be chosen to be Einstein. Okay, so this is. This is old theory. We saw that the 
Kähler Ricci flow, well, the Ricci flow starting from a Kähler metric will preserve the Kähler condition. And the resulting flow is referred to as the Kähler Ricci flow. We saw that the best argument is likely for holonomy reasons. It preserves holonomy and the Kähler condition is expressed via a holonomy condition. Now, a cohomology class in degree two uh, is said to be a Kähler class. It can be represented by a Kähler form. And the set of all Kähler classes forms an open convex cone. And that's what we refer to as the Kähler cone. So this we saw last week. And now let's, let's say something new. So there's this very important criterion for checking whether a cohomology class is Kähler, and that was given by Demailly and Pound in 2004. This is in their annals paper. This is a vast generalization of what's referred to as the Nakai Moisheshin criterion in the case of surfaces. And we have here that a cohomology class alpha is Kähler if and only if for all positive dimensional analytic subvarieties, which are irreducible. The intersection number, which we define to be the integral of the top power of the representative, is positive. So this, this was quite a bit, I mean, you know, it's an annals paper, it's quite a big deal, this, this statement. Um, and this will actually turn out to play a, a key, key role in bypassing the higher order estimates once we have a C2 estimate. So a cohomology class, which happens to lie on the boundary of the Kähler cone, we saw last week that that is given, well, that's what we refer to as a NEF class. And that has a particularly important um, interpretation in terms of the Kähler Ricci flow. So we also mentioned that the Kähler Ricci flow has this unique solution up to some maximal time T, which is determined by the following cohomological data. So essentially the Kähler Ricci flow exists for all time as long as it lies in the, the Kähler cone. So in particular, if we look at a long time solution, one that exists for all time, then that is one in which the canonical bundle would have to be NEF by that previous criterion. And let me just mention that we'll, we'll also use this later that the, the cohomology class itself converges to the uh, two pi times the first churn class of the canonical bundle. And so you can formulate that just by expressing the previous condition, change, change it to exponentials and so on instead of, instead of the linear term, you get these decaying exponentials. Okay, so one of the key objects that we wanted to to understand was this, this holomorphic sectional curvature, which appeared towards the end of the talk last time. So if we take R to be the Ramanian curvature tensor of the Kähler metric, in the Hermitian case, you would more likely take the churn connection. If you have your complex structure J, then the holomorphic sectional curvature is given by this, this here. We take U, J, U, U, J, U. So it's, if we look at the sectional curvature, it's the restriction to the J invariant two planes. And in terms of, if we, take a, if we take a frame, then we would have this local expression here, the RIJKL, VI, VJ, VK, VL. Okay, so we didn't actually really do much with it last time, but let me just remind you that at least the way I like to think about it, I like to think about the holomorphic sectional curvature as controlling the distortion of holomorphic maps. So if I have, a, let's say a compact Kähler manifold with a Kähler metric of negative holomorphic sectional curvature, then every holomorphic map from C into my manifold will be constant. On the other hand, if I happen to have a compact Kähler manifold with positive holomorphic sectional curvature, and in fact, any two points would lie in the image of a rational curve. And I can, I've, I've taken it to be C here, but I, what I just said there would be with P1. Okay, so to, what I just said there was the following, which was a compact 
scalar manifold with negative holomorphic sectional is Kobashi hyperbolic. And in the compact case, it's equivalent to Brody hyperbolicity, which states that all holomorphic maps from C into the manifold are constant. On the other hand, positive holomorphic sectional curvature implies rational connectedness. So any two points lie in the image of a holomorphic map from P1 into X. Now, both of these are false, by the way. In this, this interpretation is false. You should always have an example where your intuition fails you. Demi-E has constructed an example of a surface which it, it, it's a, you take a, um, G, a sufficiently high genus curve on the base and then with sufficiently high genus curves in the fiber. What you do is you, you, you get a singular fiber, which is so singular, which breaks one of Demi-E's criterion for the existence of a metric of negative polymorphic sectional curvature. It's like a riemann hertzebruck uh, formula, if that means anything. Sorry, Kai, what, what do you mean by these are false? They're false in the sense that the intuitions one gets from these theorems do not characterize the holomorphic sectional curvature in the sense that there oh, exists. Oh, they, they, the converse assertion. Yeah, the converse assertions okay. are false in both directions, yeah. Um, and so that's it's really the question of what this object is because this is the best intuition I can give you, but I can also give you examples in both cases where the, these statements, the converse is not true. So that's, that's the mystery. What is, this, what is this curvature? So, okay, so this, was, this is the Wu Yao theorem now. The Wu, Yi, the Wu Yao theorem states that we have this form, we have this very interesting relationship between the Ricci curvature and the holomorphic sectional curvature. Recall that the holomorphic sectional and the Ricci both control the scalar curvature. They're both dominated by the bisectional, but they don't control one another. But if the holomorphic sectional curvature has to be is negative, for instance, then there is a cohomologous metric which has negative Ricci. It's not clear at all. And this, this is actually a completely open problem, whether the metric has to be changed. It would be interesting to know. In the positive case, this theorem is, is, is false. Uh, there are examples with positive holomorphic sectional that don't have positive Ricci. But at present, it's, the, the whole situation is not clear at all. And so the way one kind of gets it is, is purely through the, the cohomology roots. You prove ampleness and then deduce, okay, well, there must be a metric of negative Ricci. Okay, so here's, here's the strategy for the argument. We wanna show that if we have a metric of negative holomorphic sectional curvature, then the Kähler Ricci flow exists for all time. And from the previous nonsense, we saw that that's equivalent to the canonical bundle being NEF. Now, NEF isn't sufficient for ampleness, but if we can actually show that the limiting class is ample, or the limiting class happens to be a Kähler class, then since that limiting class is two pi times the first churn class of the canonical bundle, it'll follow that that being a Kähler class will give you ampleness of the canonical bundle. Now, most, most of the work is showing uh, is, is in establishing this second order estimate here, that the solution omega t of the Kähler Ricci flow is bounded from below by some Kähler metric omega hat, and this is the metric with negative holomorphic section. Apologies for just the com complete lack of consistency. Um, this omega here should be omega hat. Omega hat is the metric with negative holomorphic sectional curvature. And once we have this condition, what we can do, or once we have this estimate, we can apply the Demi-E uh, pound criterion to show that the limiting class is indeed a Kähler class. And then, then we're done. If you, don't, if you don't use this criterion, you have to prove higher order estimates. And no one wants to do that. Okay. So if we take 
suppose we have a holomorphic map from X to Y, both let's say compact Kähler. Then we take omega X to be a metric on X, omega Y to be a metric on Y. Then we look at the norm squared of the derivative. That's, that's exactly the trace with respect to the source metric of the pullback of the target metric. And so in particular, if I have an estimate on the norm squared of this holomorphic map, of the derivative of the holomorphic map, then that will give me an estimate on this trace, which is then gonna give me an estimate from below the desired estimate I want. So the aim is to get estimates on the norm squared of the derivative of a holomorphic map. Okay, so the way to do that is, is through the Schwartz lemma. The Schwartz lemma tells you in the most broad sense how holomorphic maps can be distorted and the influence that curvature plays on the distortion of such, such maps. The way I like to think about it, and this is kind of stolen from Eels and Samson, I think in their paper, there's this long, it's from the harmonic map people. And then you think of this in terms of the, um, uh, what, is, what is the, what is the term? The, the, um, Tension field, that's what I'm after. Yeah, the tension field. So, so what you like to think about is you think of, think of X omega X is like some film, which you then, when you look at your image under the holomorphic map, you're placing it into a subsequent manifold. And then it's, it's, it's put in a state of elastic tension. And if it's a holomorphic map, you really want that to sit in a state of elastic equilibrium. Now, from here, from this kind of dogma, we'll see that the, the tension that this, this film is well, experiences is determined by the holomorphic sectional curvature of the target manifold, since we have kind of distortion control of holomorphic maps. And then from discussions with Ben, we, we settled that the, the reason why the Ricci curvature would appear on the source is that's kind of setting up your, your ground state, you know, what you're measuring elastic tension with respect to. That would be the average of all the curvatures in the in the uh, source directions. So, of course, that's just yeah, that's that's just uh, heuristic and intuition. But we'll see how that manifests when we actually do this calculation. This is the starting point, and I, sh I should emphasize this is rather my starting point. The number of ways you could approach these calculations is, you know, there are lots of people have different ways of doing it. A lot of them are just by direct calculation. The, what I brought to the subject was kind of a unified way of looking at all the forms of the Schwartz lemma that exist in the literature. And they are, they are unified through this perspective. So what you do is you start with this general Bochner formula, which says that if you have a holomorphic vector bundle, you take a holomorphic section of that bundle, then the complex Hessian, by which I mean I to D bar of the norm squared of this holomorphic section is going to be given by the, here we have a, uh, the one zero part of the connection, the churn connection on this bundle. And then there's, and then you minus this curvature, the curvature acting on this section. So this is the starting, this is the starting formula. Now, in our case, we want to estimate the derivative. And the derivative is a section of this twisted cotangent bundle. It takes in the tangent vector and outputs an F uh, pull, you know, pull back of the tangent bundle of Y. So you think of it as this type of valued one zero form. But now if I know I'm looking at a holomorphic section of a tensor product of two bundles. Then I know that the curvature of the tensor product of two bundles will split additively. And the curvature of the dual will, will incur a minus sign. So I have a negative contribution from the source and a positive contribution from the target.
Now how that manifests is as follows, just plugging exactly sigma as partial f and the curvature with this additive splitting. And we get this formula here. This doesn't really tell you much, admittedly, but you want to keep your hands off as much as possible until, until you're ready to actually get your hands dirty. At this point, it's more transparent to see it in coordinates, at least for me. If, if it's not, um, please please tell me, um, because I look, I've been looking at this for, for too long. Um, so what do we see here? We see that if we look at the complex Hessian of the norm squared of the derivative of a holomorphic map, I should add here that the, the superscript is, is when you locally write f as f1 through fn, fk is the kth, uh, the derivative in the kth direction. Of course, I assume everyone looks at these all day and therefore doesn't need to know that notation, but of course, of course you do. So for instance, if we look at this term here, we're looking at the two, we're looking at two derivatives on the gamma component. Now you can get these formulas uh, purely by direct calculation in the Kähler case. If someone can do it directly in the Hermitian case, I'd be very impressed. I've tried, it doesn't, even um, I asked Fung Young Zheng if he could do it directly and he said, no, he hasn't, he hasn't been able to do it directly. So you, everyone uses this Bochner formula. In any case, so, we have three terms to understand, but actually, in fact, we really only have two terms to understand since the first term is more or less harmless. First, first term is just the norm squared of the covariant derivative of, of uh, the, the derivative of f. So it's a, po it's a positive term, perfectly fine. The next term is a source, curve, what I refer to as the source curvature term. And then we have the opposing contribution from the target curvature term. The source curvature term is controlled by the Ricci curvature, since the Ricci is just going to be the contraction of the first two indices. And it's interesting, uh, since, since we have people who understand Hermitian geometry, it's, it's curious to me that you contract over the first two. Of course, it's completely obvious from the formula, but you get the second churn Ricci curvature here. And the second churn Ricci is the non cohomological one, which I find very interesting. You want to prove if, if it was contraction over K and L, you would get the, the cohomological Ricci curvature, the first churn Ricci curvature. It's interesting, it doesn't appear in the Schwarzlimmer. That's interesting to me. Okay, so how do you carry out the estimate? Well, you suppose that your Ricci curvature is bounded below in the following way. So C1 and C2 have to be non-negative here. So if I just, I, I've included all the details because I want to show everyone how elementary these second order estimates are. And it's just nice to include the details. So you, you assume you have a, a bound of this type, then this was the source curvature term that we had to estimate. And when you, you just plug it in accordingly, noticing that the contractions here work fine, or the indices work fine. And then what you get is you get minus C1 times the trace. This is just the norm squared of your derivative of your holomorphic map. And then a Cauchy-Schwartz argument tells you you get the norm squared of the derivative squared again. So the, the point being is that this term is easy to understand. If you have a Ricci lower bound, life is straightforward. What remains to understand is, is this term. This we really, this, this has motivated a lot, a lot of effort. Um, this has really been where the, where the focus has been regarding the second order estimates. So to try to understand it, let's choose coordinates, local coordinates such that the metrics are Euclidean at that point and such that the, 
the map, the derivative of the map is diagonalized. And these are the Sorry, Kyle, can, can I interrupt you? Um, of course. I got lost, but uh, I want to understand mm -hmm. what's going on. So um, what is F in the context of F the is a, theorem? So F, so this is actually beyond the Wuyal theorem. F is just a holomorphic map from X to Y, where X and Y are just compact yeah, yeah, but, element wells. Uh, Okay, but I thought we were trying to, to prove an estimate for the... You're actually going to apply yeah. this to the identity map, right? Is that... Exactly, I'm yeah. going to do it oh to the identity God. map. Oh, okay. But <laughs> okay, 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 it's, okay. it's not illuminating <laughs> if I just do it for the identity map. And... Okay, okay. Okay, that's, that was a very good question. Um, yeah, why start estimating air for you? <laughs> Thanks, Ben. That's the... Uh, the hidden hidden uh, hidden example everyone everyone has in the back of their mind when they do this. Um, apologies. Okay. So for general holomorphic maps, however, if we are going to write f like this, and we'll choose coordinates such that our our derivative of f is um, written in terms of the principal values lambda i then we will write this curvature term in these coordinates. And then what, what you end up getting is this. You get a sum of curvatures, alpha, alpha bar, gamma, gamma bar, which, which looks kind of like a bisectional curvature, but you're averaging it and weighting it over squares of the principal values. And this, this is what I, I looked at this for a very long time. And this, this was kind of like I, this argument I've laid out so far was given in 2015. It's been around for quite, quite some time, but no one bothered to try to understand what this curvature term really was. I mean, so I should say that Yang and Zheng in 2015 found this, sum of squares of bisectional curvatures which are weighted and so forth and they just called that the real bisectional and that's what they said they go okay assume this thing is bounded you know by uh above by zero or a negative constant and then the schwartz lemma goes through in the hermitian case and so forth but they didn't tell us how to interpret it or what it meant and and ben knows very well I spoke with Tian, there was just no meaning anyone could give to this thing. Then in uh, 2021, um, I, I discovered that you could interpret this thing as, as a Rayleigh quotient. A Rayleigh quotient is just, you take a matrix A and it's V transpose AV divided by V transpose V. So it's, it's, it's a function which is maximized at the, the eigenvalues, these things, the critical points of the eigenvalues of this matrix. The Rayleigh quotient gives you a variational characterization of the eigenvalues. And once you kind of formulate everything in this language, then it kind of becomes clear on how to kind of optimize it or it becomes more transparent. And it turns out that what Yang and Zheng did could be sharpened. And that's, that's what I did. And since you need to introduce even more jargon into the field, I decided to call it the second Schwartz bisectional curvature. The reason why it's called the second Schwartz is because there's also a first one, and that's related to an to another to another inequality relating to the Schwartz line. So, in in Hermitian geometry, we we now have this mess of curvature constraints, and it's extremely difficult to keep track of. Let me just plug some of my some of my work. Um, at the start of this year, Kai Tang and I released a paper which kind of systematically, or at least we, we try to be as systematic as possible, goes through all of these curvature constraints and the various uh, conditions on these. Um, that, yeah, it's, you know, there's a lot of calculations in that paper. And it's, it's not, by no means complete. For instance, there's no discussion at all of the first Schwartz bisectional curvature in that paper. Okay, so this, this is really for the Hermitian case though. So we're in the Kähler case. So actually life, life is a little easier for us. 
And that's because of the following result of Royden. So in the Kähler case, the target curvature term is actually controlled by the holomorphic section. And people falsely believed that was true in the Hermitian case, unfortunately. Um, but it's based, based on the following, following fact that Royden proved in about 1980, I think, around that period. So you take xi1 through xi nu to be orthogonal tangent vectors, and you consider a symmetric biohermitian form, call it S, which is understood to have the following two symmetries. And Royden shows that if, if it's bounded in this way, here kappa can be positive or negative, then you get bounds on the alpha alpha bar beta beta bar in terms of something of this type. Moreover, if it happens to be negative or non-positive, then you can squeeze a little more out. Now the proof is just linear algebra. It's it just well, not even linear algebra, you just write everything out and you kind of you just use these symmetries and, and the result falls. It would be nice to actually get some intuition on what this result actually. If there's anything deeper there, it may not be anything deeper other than just you know elementary consequences of you just impose these conditions, you get something out. But it would it would be interesting to try to get uh, more understanding of what this Royden trick is. Um, no one has done that. So okay, so if you have Royden, then the final estimate you get is the following. So this is your, your Chern Lu or Schwartz Lemma estimate. So you take your, so I've also just completely abused the fact that I put a logarithm in there, but that just makes everything nice and clean. You get the first, these first two terms are coming from the Ricci curvature estimate we saw before, but then the target curvature is handled by Royden's trick. And so that's, that's the that's the main estimate here, and I've yeah I've just reminded everyone that these are the estimates we were assuming, and this is this is the key point to the Wu Yao theorem. Once you have this, so if you can prove better versions of this, you get better versions of the Wu Yao theorem. So at present, since I have the best Schwartz lemma, I have the best Wu Yao theorem. That's that's it. It's once yeah that's. It's really the name of the game. Now, how are we going to apply this to the theorem we want to prove? Well, we're going to apply it with the target curvature, but so the target, sorry, the source metric being the solution to the Kähler Ricci flow, omega t. Well, the target metric, that's going to be some auxiliary Kähler metric whose holomorphic sectional curvature is negative. So here, minus kappa should actually be less than zero. We'll have to do a little bit more. We'll have to get a parabolic Schwartz lemma, but that's really no, no big deal. So in fact, what we're, we're going to need just to improve it a little bit to get an estimate on this. But it's, it's really not too hard to see that with those conditions using the fact that we know the Kähler Ricci flow, that the logarithm of the trace of omega t omega hat. So here we're taking f to be the identity map, satisfies this inequality here. Okay, so the first thing we want to prove is the following. So we have a compact Kähler manifold with a Kähler metric of negative holomorphic sectional curvature then the canonical bundle is NEF, or equivalently the Kähler Ricci flow exists for all time. So by the parabolic Schwartz lemma we just proved, we can express it like this. Noticing there's just a T here. Then we apply the maximum principle we get an estimate on trace omega t omega hat in terms of, well, it's just uniformly bounded. That's what the maximum principle gives. So 
we have a uniform constant C such that omega T is bounded below by C to the negative one of omega hat. So most of the work is, is indeed in, in getting this Schwartz lemma. So once you have the Schwartz lemma, life is not so difficult. Now we can use this Demai pound criterion to show that for any fixed T zero, this limiting class is indeed a Kähler class and that will give us the Nefnus condition. But that's an immediate consequence of this second order estimate since I can write the integral over any irreducible analytic subvariety of omega T zero to the P, that's the intersection number as the limit of these, but I know that that's bounded below by C to the negative P of the integral of that, but that's this integral here. Well, that's just a Kähler, Kähler class. Fixed Kähler doesn't vary in time or anything. So that's certainly a Kähler, Kähler class and so it's positive. So in particular for any fixed T zero, this cohomology class or this Kähler class is indeed a Kähler class. It doesn't degenerate or anything like that. What is also nice is that the same argument, in fact, gives you the ampleness. So now, okay, again, assume we have a metric of negative polymorphic sectional. We know now that the Kähler Ricci flow exists for all time. We now just need to show that the limiting class happens to be Kähler. But the same argument applies. You know that your limiting class can be represented as this limit. And therefore, if I look at the, use again the Demai pound criterion, we can just compute the intersection numbers. The same argument applies. It shows that this will be positive and therefore the limiting class, which we know is two pi times the first churn class of the canonical bundle is positive. And, but if the first churn class of the canonical bundle is positive, then the canonical bundle is ample. And that's, that's the entire argument. It's completely, completely straightforward once, I mean, it's completely straightforward once you have two big zeros. Once you have the parabolic Schwartz lemma, or the Schwartz lemma specifically, and you have this demi pound criterion. Now, if you didn't want to use the demi pound criterion, you can just bootstrap using shadow estimates and standard second order, you know, bootstrapping to get higher order estimates. But this is kind of more of the cohomological side of things and is obviously more elementary than, than shadow estimates and so forth. Okay, so now the question is, what, what do we do? What do we do now? We have, this, we have this interesting theorem. I've shown you how to prove it, but you know, what's kind of illuminating. Well, one thing I wanna emphasize is that there are two bottlenecks to generating theorems of Wu Yao type. The first one is, is clear, which is the Schwartz lemma. If you improve the Schwartz lemma, you improve the Wu Yao theorems you can get. And by Wu Yao theorem, in, in, or a theorem of Wu Yao type, I mean some type of, if this is negative, then this is negative, or if this curvature is positive, then this is positive and so forth. I'm using that to mean either, mean, I'm using that to mean a Wu Yao type theorem. But even if you just take it to be negative holomorphic sectional implies some Ricci curvature is negative. And the, the Schwartz lemma is really one of the key obstructions here. The second one is the existence, and this is probably more important, the existence of an ambient Kähler structure. I need to know this Kähler cone criterion. I need to have this ampleness and then deduce the Ricci curvature constraint. If I could get it directly, it would be better. But that it appears that there's no idea on how to get rid of this ambient Kähler structure. For instance, if we look at um, the most general form of the Wu Yao theorem, this is the one I, I proved in 2021, I have to start with a compact Kähler manifold. 
I start with a compact Kalem manifold which supports a Hermitian metric. This metric doesn't have to be Kalem with negative second Schwartz bisectional curvature. Then the canonical bundle is ample. First question along the lines of can the Schwartz lemma be improved is can the second Schwartz bisectional curvature be relaxed to the holomorphic sectional? So if the metric is, is Kala, then this is, this is what Royden did. But in, that's not present. The curvature doesn't have those symmetries in the Hermitian case. So can that be, that's, this is completely unknown. In the second direction, the furthest progress has been made by Manchun Li, which states the following. So we're removing the ambient Kähler condition now. We don't need any Kähler structure. We take X omega zero to be a compact Hermitian manifold. This bisectional curvature is non-positive. Again, red flags go up, people reject it immediately. It's a very restrictive condition, but that's not the point of this theorem. The point is that there's no Kähler assumption here. If you take omega t to be a solution of the Hermitian curvature flow, which is given as follows. So you just flow it along the minus second Chern-Ricci. Then if the first Chern-Ricci, so this is the one that appears in the Schwartz lemma, but this is the cohomological one. And we're not assuming a positive, we're assuming a quasi-negativity condition in the sense that the first Chern-Ricci is non-positive, but it's negative at least at one point or somewhere. If that's the case, then the canonical bundle is ample. And so it happens to be projective and, and so forth. Again, let me, let me reiterate, even though these curvature constraints are extremely restrictive, none of them are Kähler. And this is, this is kind of the big deal. And what's also disappointing is we don't know how to, to go further. Okay, so let me just, just, uh, just fit. Oh, that, that result you just mentioned there, um, what does the Ricci flow have to do with it? Uh, yeah, so you fl yeah. It, it flows to a, a um, does he flow to an Einstein? Well, you get an Einstein metric at the end, but it flows it. So what it does, it will bump the first churn Ricci to something that's actually strictly negative. And if right, that's okay. true, then so you get a conclusion here is to something that follows from the conditions on the initial metric, right? So that's, but so the, the point is you use the Ricci flow to prove it. Is that? Yeah, you flow to something that is, that has a strictly, that, that has a cohomology class that's, that's positive. But the, the, the theorem itself has nothing to do with the Ricci flow, right? It's the statement of the proof doesn't involve Ricci flow. The statement of the theorem doesn't. Yeah, this Ricci statement of theorem is obviously poorly. Uh, I've, okay, I've right. batched a bunch of the things I wanted to put together. Um, yep. Yeah, don't don't read any of the slides literally. Uh, yeah, thanks for thanks for pointing that out. Um, so, what I want to just just conclude with is the following conjectures and, and questions. Kind of nice thing to prove would be if we take any compact Hermitian manifold which has negative holomorphic sectional curvature, then the canonical bundle is ample. That would be very nice. And this fits more generally into these Kobayashi conjectures and so forth, and the Green Griffiths Lang conjecture and so forth. So this is not just an isolated problem that not many people are caring about. But another type of question would be. So if I take a compact Hermitian manifold with negative holomorphic sectional, so this is, this is kind of a, a similar statement, but what I want to actually ask is the second Chern Ricci negative is the first Chern Ricci negative. What kind of general Wu Yao theorem in the sense that if the holomorphic sectional is negative, how many Ricci curvatures can we get to be negative as well? And do they have to actually be different metrics? Can they be all? Uh, can they all be taken to be the same metric? Okay. Right. So uh, that question there is not about a particular metric. It's whether it whether it carries a metric with that second condition. Yeah. And I also want to know if it is the same metric, though. 
if there is a particular metric. I so that's a, a lot question of, of linear algebra, right? As opposed to any analysis, it's just a point-wise condition on the coverage operator. So it's a very different question, I guess. Yeah. Mm. Is it? Is it just a question? Well, I mean, the, the curvature like condition is a condition at one point on your curvature operator, right? And you want to ask whether that implies another curvature condition at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it should be just linear algebra, right? Um, it should be. Uh, okay, right, yeah, no, I, 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 understand, I understand. I understand now. Um, yeah, but we, we, we don't know. We, I, I don't know how easy it is to actually calculate that linear algebra. Um, yeah. Okay, that's uh, where I want to where I want to stop. Thank you very much. Cool. Thanks for your talk, Carl. No one have any comments or questions for Carl at this point? So uh, one question, Carl, uh, you're referring mm -hmm. to this estimate as a second order estimate. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, well, I don't know, the way you phrase it, it looks like a bound on a first derivative and then you actually phrase it as a, a just an inequality between two metrics. But is that come from the fact that the it, it's a second derivative bound on a potential function? Or, yeah, that's why. Yeah, that's okay. why. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, you know, if they're cohomologous metrics, you have this DD bar. DD bar is a two derivative on the potential. So yeah, that's exactly what we understand to me. I don't know why I went to a random slide. Um, <laughs> Yeah, people refer to estimates of this type as exactly second order estimates. Whether people should oh. call them second order, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. For a Riemannian geometer, second order sort of reminds me of curvature, right? But uh, it's, I understood why uh, in Kähler geometry, those are called second order. Uh, but in, whether they should be still called that in in Hermitian geometry, yeah, is, is uh, not so unclear. clear. Um, um, the question is, if you have an ample canonical bundle, does that imply that uh, you are a projective manifold? Yeah, you just take sufficiently high powers of that, so, and you will. Right. So, in particular, you are saying that negative um, holomorph HPC. Uh, should only occur on manifolds which are Kähler, which admit Kähler. Which are projective, right. even better than Kähler. Yeah. Projective, yes, yes, projective Kähler. There are no right. such examples. So those that, are, uh, those are, I mean, pretty, it's a really strong claim, right? But it is a strong anyway. claim, but in the sense that if you asked for negative first churn Ricci, that would give you, those only occur on, on our projective manifolds as well. We have to be careful okay. what you're saying there, right? I mean, you can certainly have a metric which is non Kähler, which has that condition. It just means there is some other metric that is Kähler. Yes, yes, sorry. You, you yeah, don't have yeah, to be careful yeah, yeah. what of is the Kähler. I'm talking about it's Kähler, yeah. and I think topologically Kähler, or yeah, whatever, yeah, complex yeah. manifold Kähler, right? Sure, Not right. metrically. Um, but okay. Uh, yeah, okay. okay. So, why, how, how do you prove that negative Ricci implies projective? If you have negative first churn Ricci, then you can do the then you now oh hang on hang on sorry sorry uh no that's that requires the Kähler condition as well sorry you will oh, have a yeah. Kähler structure because yeah yeah, the, yeah. The, so you yeah. are already on there is some background so, Kähler. so yeah. if you have just a general Hermitian manifold which has negative first churn Ricci that has to be Kähler because the negative first churn Ricci implies that that will represent a cohomology class which you just take minus of that will give you a will give you a Kähler class. That does not say that that thing now has positive or negative Ricci, but yeah. it will. You okay, have a okay. Kähler so class. yeah, okay. You you use the cohomology interpretation. Okay, but here with the HPC, there's nothing even remotely. The homomorphic close sectional to that. curvature is not cohomological. Right. And that's why we have okay. no idea about it. Okay. Interesting. Um, yeah. And thanks. Yeah, if I in if you speak with Simony Devirio, he's someone who works on this green Griffiths Lang thing. He'll say that it's just supernatural. This thing, this object is it just behaves 
in it. Like for instance, if you know you have a Kähler metric, the holomorphic sectional um, governs the entire curvature in the sense that if two curvature operators agree on the holomorphic sectional, then they agree entirely. And so if you have constant holomorphic sectional, you get space forms if they're Kähler. If in the Hermitian case, you know, you get these conjectures which are which are still unknown. Um, it's supernatural in the sense of spooky and ghost-like or exactly. just extremely natural. Oh, I see, right. Yeah. Yeah. Supernatural in the sense of no idea what's going on. You know, just, yeah. It's just beyond beyond us. Um, yeah. Is anything known if you consider maybe um, the bismuth connection or something? Even less. Yeah. I so don't even know. Anything. So th this is a project I'm currently um, working on with, with Fang Yang Zheng. We're trying to get a one parameter family of Schwartz lemmas where we vary the connection hmm. along the Gordeshon line and so on. Yeah. It'd be nice to, to see if things appeared for them, but it's, it's very hard to get the Bochner formula and things yeah. of that type. It's people was, haven't done that. <laughs> <laughs> we you have any references for uh, <laughs> Bochner formulas along the Goldschon line? Exactly. That's what we would like. <laughs> if we had that, we would have our, our paper ready by now. Um, <laughs> oh, really? Okay. So there's no yeah. real. That's amazing. I mean, it's, we need, I don't we need know some where PhD it is. student to, to do that, right? To do what this, do you think, so, <laughs> <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing for the next couple of months? So it'll get you a. Uh, um, no, busy, I guess I guess busy. James already has the formula, but it's not uh, the you know Bochner type of uh, sophisticated yeah. proof you would like. It's more like hands-on. You know, you yeah. get dirty from the start, and and it, a... I mean, it gives you a formula, right? And that that's enough. But I thought maybe that's a conceptual explanation for why these formulas are there. And it's clearly the same Bochner formula, right? But I don't. I don't know the setup. Maybe there is something in the literature. Maybe the, not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure. And Hang Yang Zheng isn't sure either. If he doesn't know, then I. Uh, yeah. There probably isn't, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's some work of um. Uh, someone has done some calculations with the bismuth, which I have worked through, and I'm blanking on what his name is at the moment. He he introduced a he introduced a curvature constraint. Um, when he looked at the Bochner formula in the bismuth case. I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll well, let you know. One of the Italians. No, no, he's, no? he's Chinese. He's, Chinese, he's, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm blanking. I've read the paper a couple of times. I'll, I'll send it to you though. I'll send it, I'll send it to both of you. Um, Thanks. Yeah. If anyone does know Bochner formula though, by all means, uh, Send them my way. <laughs> All right, cool. Maybe we can wrap it up there. Thanks again for participating and giving us your thoughts on the topic, Carl. Thank you. Cool. I'll stop recording now. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I hope we'll see you next time.